let us worship the Lord. And we do so by turning together to Psalm 119. We're going to do today as we did last week. We're going to read uh, just now and then at the very end we shall have a singing. The focus is going to be in this psalm, Psalm 119. We're going to read just now from the beginning of the psalm. Blessed are they that undefiled and straight are in the way, who in the Lord's most holy law do walk and do not stray. Blessed are they who to observe his statutes are inclined, and who do seek the living God with their whole heart and mind. Such in his ways do walk, and they do no iniquity. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts carefully. Oh, that thy statutes to observe, thou wouldst my ways direct. Then shall I not be shamed when I thy precepts all respect. Then, with integrity of heart, thee will I praise and bless. When I the judgments all have learned, thy pure righteousness but I will keep thy statutes all firmly resolve have I oh do not then most gracious God forsake me utterly let us come before the Lord in prayer Blessed are they that undefiled and straight are in the way. Eternal Lord, we acknowledge that our God is undefiled and straight, and that that is the path we should follow as well, being created as rational creatures. But we acknowledge that we fell from the estate in which we were created by sinning against God and that undefiled and straightness no longer marks our way or our character but that we have become like the one who enticed us first into sin defiled and crooked the heart thy word tells us is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it we acknowledge eternal lord today that thy word is true that its testimony regarding what we are and what we are like is true and that in us by nature there dwells the potential for every sin and for every vice and that if we are given the opportunity and given the means, we will run to any length in sin. Help us, eternal Lord, to realize that that is how we are. For unless we realize how we are, the process of becoming something else by the grace of God will never begin. For it must begin with an acknowledgement that the word of God is true in its testimony about us and not merely a head acknowledgement but a heart realization that it is so that we need to be saved saved not merely from external forces but saved from what we are and what is in us create a clean heart Lord when you are right spirit within we seek eternal Lord today thy face thy favor thy grace 
we seek eternal Lord today to come in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ we seek eternal Lord today grace to worship before the footstool and the great throne of Almighty God we acknowledge eternal Lord thy greatness and thy majesty we acknowledge that it is a wonder that that power is not directed against us when we consider what is in our own hearts and in our lives. Help us, eternal Lord, to be humble. Help us, eternal one, to be led by the Spirit. Uh, we need that. And we need to be saved from all the distractions that would take our mind away from the truth. And to be focused on thy word today. Give thanks, eternal Lord, for the Lord's goodness and grace over this past week. Another week has gone, another week has begun. We have been spared to see another Lord's Day. Receive our thanks for thy goodness and hear our petitions for thy continued grace over the coming days. We pray for homes and families, kith and kin. We pray for those among them who know and who love the Lord. May they grow in knowledge and may they grow in faith. May the, the work of God's Spirit in our hearts be very clear and very evident. For where the Spirit begins a good work, it will continue. It can only grow and develop under thy hand. We pray for any who are searching and seeking. Draw near, O Lord, we pray. And give light where there is darkness and understanding where there is confusion. We pray, eternal one, thy blessing upon those who are unable to say today that they are the Lord's. We pray, Lord, that they would come to know the one whom to know is life eternal. That they might come to embrace Jesus Christ, freely offered in the gospel. We pray for our denomination. Bless and pity us. Remember us in our weakness and in our needs, even as we give thanks for thy goodness toward us. Remember, we pray, the uh, cause of Christ beyond our denominational barriers and borders. We pray for all who love the Lord and who preach the gospel whether in our own country or to the far ends of the earth. Bless our own mission work, particularly in Sri Lanka. Watch over them and keep them safe. And grant, Lord, that the barriers which are there in that land against the gospel might be taken away, and that those who might long to come and worship with the congregations there might find that the things that keep them away are not as strong as the pool that brings them there. And if that's our prayer for Sri Lanka, it's our prayer for Scotland, for this United Kingdom and for the nations of the world. It's our prayer as we consider thine ancient people. It's our prayer for the Gentile races. The Spirit of God will be at work with irresistible grace drawing in and drawing to thyself men and women, boys and girls. We pray for government. We pray for those who rule us, that they would be given grace to fulfill their duties well and responsibly. That they would be given wisdom to know what to do and what not to do. And we pray particularly for Christians and public service who have not only got to try to do what is best but try to do what is right and what is 
best in the light of God's word. We have to place that before any other concern and any other consideration. Give them grace, Lord, we pray, and more grace. And grant that they would have a witness that would be to the glory of God and to the good of many souls. Remember those who are unwell, those who are unable to be with us today. We are thankful that some are able to join with us electronically. Remember them, Lord. Remember their cares and their needs. Be undertaking, be strengthening, be helping. And in all these things be glorified. Pray for those who are worried, concerned, downcast, discouraged. Those whose spirits are low whose circumstances are hard. We pray for those who know bereavement into all of these situations. Be entering and be well, taking good out of illness and light out of darkness. The enemy loves to sow confusion, loves to sow discord, loves to sow discouragement. Grant, Lord, that even this planting of bad things would be overruled for the promotion and the growth of what is good. Thou art able to do that and far beyond what we can even begin to think or imagine. Be with us now. Lead us as we read thy word. Give us a spirit of praise, a spirit of worship. Give us eyes that, can, that look to Christ even as we confess sin. And that trust in him, his shed blood, the preciousness of his atonement, the wonder of his grace, the marvel of his continued intercession. Hear us, Lord, and be with us. And pardon our sin. For Jesus' sake, amen. Can we read together now in God's word, in the scriptures of the Old Testament, the scriptures of the Old Testament, and in the book of the Judges, and chapter 2. The book of the Judges, and chapter 2, and we're going to Commence our reading at verse 6. <clears throat> Judges chapter 2, commencing our reading at verse 6. And uh, in this section we're going to see really a summary of uh, the period uh, before this and at this time in the history of Israel. Judges chapter 2, reading from verse 6, and we're going to read down to verse 19. And when Joshua had let the people go, the children of Israel went every man unto his inheritance to possess the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being a hundred and ten years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in timnath Herod, in the mountain of Ephraim, on the north side of the hill Gaash. And also all that generation were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord. That's a very significant detail there, isn't it? They knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. So he's 
cataloging for us here the, the decline that came in very quickly. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt, and followed other gods of the gods of the people that were round about them, and bowed themselves unto them, and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord, and served Baal and Ashtaroth. Ashtaroth was a pretended female deity. And after and the, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them, and he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about, so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn to them. And they were greatly distressed. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges, which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. And yet they would not hearken to their judges, but they went a whoring after other gods and bowed themselves to them. They turned quickly out of the way which their fathers had walked in, obeying the commandments of the Lord, but they did not so. And when the Lord raised them up, judges, then the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hands of their enemies all the days of the judge. For it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. And it came to pass when the judge was dead, this was pretty well the pattern with all the judges, Samson, Gideon, Jephthah, and so on. It came to pass when the judge was dead, whichever one it was, that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and to bow down unto them. They ceased not from their own doings, nor from their stubborn way. So it was for decades and decades and decades until a couple of hundred years have passed. Can we now read a further passage, a little further on in Scripture, in the first book of Samuel and chapter 1? The first book of Samuel and chapter 1. Here we're picking up the historical narrative, more or less at the point at which we left it there in the book of Judges. God raising up judge after judge, things improving for a while, but then back again to the same old way, same old problems. Now there was a certain man of Ramathame Zophim of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jehoram, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephrathite. And he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. That was the meeting place. That's where uh, they were appointed. We're talking here, of course, from the days before the uh, erection of the temple in the days of Solomon. The appointed place was Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penina his wife and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah. The Lord had shut up her womb. And her adversary also provoked her so, for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Then said Elkanah, her husband, to Hannah, Why weepest thou? Why eatst thou not? Why is thy heart grieved? 
not I better to thee than ten sons? And so on. The Lord followeth his blessing, that reading of his own holy and inerrant word of truth. We turn in our Psalters to Psalm 119, and we're going to read some verses now from verse 17. Psalm 119, reading at verse 17. The psalmist here is pouring out his heart in prayer. With me, thy servant, in thy grace, deal bountifully, Lord, that by thy favor I may live and duly keep thy word. Open mine eyes, that of thy law the wonders I may see. I am a stranger on this earth. Hide not thy laws from me. My soul within me breaks, and doth much fainting still endure through longing that it hath all times unto thy judgments pure. Thou hast rebuked the cursed crowd, who from thy precepts swerve. Reproach and shame remove from me, for I thy laws observe. Against me princes spake with spite, while they in council sat. But I, thy servant, did upon thy statutes meditate. My comfort and my heart's delight, thy testimonies be. And they, in all my doubts and fears, are counselors to me. We know Unite together again in prayer. Draw near, O Lord, to us. But we feel at times as we gather in worship that we are not getting beyond the physical. that we are not making contact with heaven itself and that we are left to ourselves. Grant, Lord, that it might not be so, but that thy spirit would speak to us as we handle the word, that the enemy would be kept at bay, and that all of us, whether listening at home or gathered here, would feel the power of God's Spirit accompanying the Word. Would feel the Word of God addressing ourselves. And would feel ourselves led, as it were, by the hand into thy presence. Where we would acknowledge our sin, not in a merely formal and perfunctory way, but with true sorrow, in genuine repentance, and where we would find the preciousness of Christ's blood, personal and real for ourselves, and where it would mean more than the world to us, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Draw near to us, Lord, we pray. We beseech, we beg. Notwithstanding all that is with us, that is not right and that is not good and that is not as it should be, 
come over, as it were, these mountain barriers that stand as provocation. Where sin abounds, let grace much more abound. And may we find ourselves at the feet of Christ, with his grace in us, his mercy toward us, and our eyes upon him. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, friends, seeking the light of God's Spirit on his word. We turn again to the scriptures of the Old Testament, and to that second passage from which we read. The first book of Samuel, chapter 1. We'll read at verse 1. Now there was a certain man of Ramathaim Sophim, of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, and so on down to verse 8. God willing, I intend over the coming weeks and were spared, it will doubtless be months, to look with you in a series of sermons at this book of First Samuel. Now, First Samuel records a period of history that is both very interesting in and of itself, and that is also very important as it records for us the history of Israel as a people and the history, of course, of the church in these Old Testament times. Now, as we look at our Old Testaments, we see that the first five books of the Bible, the books of Moses as we call them, Pentateuch, they record for us the early history of Israel. The history, in fact, up to that point where Israel becomes a nation. By the time you come to the end of the five books of Moses, and we're looking at Deuteronomy in the prayer meeting, and you've got Israel, they've gone from being one family, Abraham, to being many families. They've gone from being slaves in Egypt to a nation in their own right, about to inherit their own land. But along with recording their history as a nation, these books also record for us the emergence of the high priest's office. Gradually, the high priest emerges in office, Aaron is the first, and then his son, and so on, down through the generations. And the high priest at this stage in Israel's history was more than just a religious official. The high priest at this stage in Israel's history also had supreme authority in the nation. But that, that, that uh, situation, that arrangement, was not intended to be permanent. It was temporary. And eventually, the high priest would make way for a king. And soon you would have a high priest in office and ordinarily a king, one king or other in office. And the two offices separate and distinct from one another. 
But there was a period in between that first establishing of the nation and the position of the high priest as a supreme official and the days when they had a king set over them as well. There was a gap. There was a period in between. And that in between period is known as the times of the judges. And we read about that in our reading there in Judges chapter 2. And that period lasted for several hundred years. These judges, they were temporary rulers, military rulers normally, who were raised up by the Lord to deliver the nation from whatever particular enemy they faced at that time. But none of them, none of them united the nation together as one nation. None of them established strong government. They delivered the nation temporarily. And then that judge would die. And we saw in Judges chapter 2 what happened. They go back to their old ways. And they're back to the beginning again. Another judge is raised up. That judge delivers them. That judge's period of office comes to an end. And you're back to square one. And that pattern repeated itself again and again. The book of Judges records that whole period for us. But the book of Judges ends on a bleak note. If you look back just a chapter or two to the end of the book of Judges, Judges chapter 21 and verse 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Well, that's what we've been saying. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. In other words, there was no order. There was no stability. Everybody did what was right in his own eyes. And the result was chaos. Spiritual chaos, national chaos, moral chaos. And if you read the last four chapters of the book of Judges, you'll get a taste of that chaos that existed in the land. It was a sad state of affairs. So you had enemies outside, always watching for weakness, always ready to pounce if there is even a hint of weakness. You have disorder within the nation. It's a time for the rise of kings to come. God had always ordained that there would be a king in Israel. But up to this point, the time had not yet come. And that's where 1 Samuel begins to unfold its history. The time for the rise of kings had come. And the man who was going to bridge that period between the time of the judges and the rise of the kings was this man, Samuel. He was going to be, as it were, a bridge between the two. And it's that man whose birth is recorded for us here. Samuel was a prophet. He was a spiritual leader. But he was also a national leader. And under Samuel, the nation would mature, the nation would be established, and the nation would pass from the disorder, the time of the judges, to a much more orderly state of affairs, firstly under Saul, and then more particularly under King David. That's the background to this book and to this period in history. But the narrative doesn't open with Samuel. It opens 
with his father, whose genealogy is set out for us in verse 1. His name is Elkanah. He is a Levite. He belongs to that tribe. And our focus this morning is on Elkanah. And I want us to notice three things about this man, Elkanah. I want us to notice, first of all, that Elkanah is a good example. Elkanah is a good example. Verse 3. And this man, Elkanah, went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. That's an important piece of information. It tells us that carefully, diligently, consistently, this man would go to Shiloh at the appointed times for worship. Now let's look more closely at this. And as we look more closely at it, I'm going to have three sub-points. First of all, he didn't let the bad example of others stop him. He didn't let the bad example of others stop him. We've already seen that Elkanah lived at a time when the religious life of the nation was at a very low ebb. Indeed, that's why it's so wonderful that Elkanah's son Samuel is about to be born, for he is the means under God by which this whole nation is going to be spiritually revived and lifted up. But in Elkanah's day, most folk didn't care much for the things of God. Some were careless in their attendance on worship. They didn't bother going to Shiloh. They might go sometimes, but they wouldn't go very often. It wasn't a priority, it wasn't an issue. Just like our own day. There was a day when things of God and the worship of God was a priority took first place. It was a matter not merely of habit but of real interest and concern but we live in a day when that's not the case. It is rather striking that despite the Lord speaking so clearly over these past months how little impression it seems to have made, how little effect it seems to have had on attendance in public worship. Doors are now open. I don't see any great particular change. Some folk in Elkanah's day, they worshipped other gods. That was just a fact of life in Israel. They were inclined to get themselves involved in all manner of idolatry and some of it abominable practices. And there's plenty of that in 2020 as well. Not gods of silver and gold and wood and stone, but more sophisticated than that. But there are other gods. An idol is anything that takes the place of God. And there's plenty of that. Modern man hasn't stopped worshipping. Hasn't stopped serving a God. Just changes his God. But Elkanah isn't looking at other people. His concern. His business was with the Lord. And supposing no one else went to Shiloh. Supposing his neighbors were careless. Supposing they sneered at him and spoke behind his back. So be it. Yearly it tells us he went up to Shiloh to worship the Lord of hosts. His concern and his business 
was with the Lord's. And so, friend, is yours. We're so concerned with what other people say and other people think. And if we were half as concerned with what the Lord says and the Lord thinks and the Lord sees, how much better it would be. You see, people will say, well, I don't go to church, but that's common. But the fact that others neglect the things of God is of no comfort to you. It's of no assistance to you. And it will be of zero assistance to you on the day when you stand like me before Almighty God. God won't ask any of us what others did. Will he allow us to drag such irrelevances in? Elkanah reminds us of the words of Joshua As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Elkanah is a good example. He didn't let the bad example of others stop him. But then, secondly, he didn't let problems in the church stop him either. He didn't let problems in the church stop him from attending. Well, what problems were there in the church? How do we know there were problems in the church in Elkanah's day? Well, did you notice the second half of verse 3? And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. You ever notice that that second half of the verse seems to stand out a bit? Why does it say that there? It seems to have no immediate relevance to the narrative at all. But it does. It's dropped in there for a reason. Because later on we're going to discover that these two men who served in the things of God were not good men. In fact, if you look at chapter 2 and verse 12, they're summed up for us. The sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They were sons of Satan. They knew not the Lord. But they were in charge, more or less, a child. We'll see later on, if we're spared, what they were up to. Now Elkanah would have been aware of this. It seems that everybody was aware of what sort of men Hophni and Phinehas were. Of what sort of disreputable conduct they were engaged in. They were thieves, they were liars, they were grossly immoral men. Amoral you might even say. Everybody knew about it. Nobody did anything about it. But everybody knew about it. And Elkanah could have said, he could have said, I'm not going to Shiloh because of the problems there. I'm not going to go up to Shiloh every year because you know Hophni and Phineas are there and they are grade one hypocrites. They are appalling people. And until somebody does something about it, I'm not going to go. say that at times, don't they? Elkanah had the perfect excuse to stay at home. Hophni and Phineas. But Elkanah wasn't looking for an excuse. He wasn't looking for an excuse. He didn't allow the sins of others to hinder his spiritual needs or to stop the good of his soul. He said, I need to go to the house of God. I need to hear the word of God. No matter what Hophni and Phineas are like, it is crucial for me, for my spiritual good. And I say the same to you. Maybe you're listening in online. Maybe you're watching this days, weeks later. And maybe that's part of your problem. You say, well, you know, there's problems in the church and there's been historically problems in the church. That's why I don't go. But 
I love Cana as a good example for you. The church has its problems in every age. If we're going to wait at home until there are zero problems in the church, we will be waiting till the end of time. Because the church is composed of sinners in a fallen, sinful world. And it also contains, let's be frank, the visible church also contains a mixture of true believers and hypocrites. And sometimes these hypocrites will be unmasked and it will become obvious what they are. They were never the lords in the first place. Judas for one. Now, Hophni and Phineas for another. So there's nothing in this world, not even the things of God that are perfect. If misconduct by other people is going to keep you from the Lord, You're going to wait until there's no sign of any of these things. You'll be waiting a very long time. But I say again, your concern and mine with you isn't what other people do. Your concern and mine is ourselves. If others didn't do what was right, well, they'll answer for that. But Elkanah, by God's grace, will attempt to keep doing what was right. He's a good example. He didn't let the bad example of others stop him. He didn't let problems in the church stop him. And thirdly, he didn't let family difficulties stop him. He didn't let family difficulties stop. Now we'll see in a moment some of the problems in Elkanah's family. And it seems from verse 7 that these problems were at least as bad, if not worse, when the family were in Shiloh for the special services. That seemed to be a catalyst for the, the jealousy and the discord in the home too. To, to explode. Satan, of course, would work hard at such times. When you go to Shiloh for the special services, he's going to make sure, if he can at all, that Elkanah and anybody else who is there is going to have zero benefit and zero profit. So he's going to pour all his energies into making the troubles in this family worse than they normally were. Now that might have led Elkanah to conclude, you'd better not go to Shiloh. You'd better not go to the special services. You'd better stay at home and not go to church. And Satan would certainly have encouraged these sort of thoughts and said, indeed, indeed, you know, Elkanah, there's problems there and, and the Lord doesn't want you to have problems and maybe you should stay at home. Difficulty or not, he doesn't abandon, he doesn't even reduce his attendance on God's house. He doesn't let family difficulty stop him. The family difficulties, the historic issues, are often a temptation to people not to attend church. Or not to attend so well. And sometimes the original reasons have disappeared so far into the past that they can scarcely be remembered. And maybe that's your problem. Again, maybe I'm speaking to somebody watching or, or listening days and weeks later, for all I know. Maybe that's exactly your problem. And you say, well, there's this issue, there's family difficulties, there are things happened, and, and, and there's all manner of complications. Okay. But remember, no problem was ever solved by less worship. 
No problem was ever solved by less worship. No problem was ever solved by less attention to the things of God. No problem was ever solved by less having of the Lord in our hearts or in our homes. The Lord says, them that honor me, I will honor. And if your relationship with him is put right, perhaps in the most astonishing way, he will put your relationship with others right as well. So Elkanah is a good example. But secondly, Elkanah is a serious warning. Elkanah is a serious warning. He's not perfect. Now, when God first created man, he also created marriage. He created a lot of things in the first beginning. We have the creation of work, we have the creation of marriage, we have the creation of the, the week, divided into six days and one, and so on. And he ordained that marriage would be between one man and one woman. Now, it didn't take sinful man long to change that. And one of the changes that was introduced very early on in, in history was polygamy. Now, what's polygamy? Well, polygamy is where at the same time a man, and usually is a man, can have more than one wife. Now, can I just introduce a little rider here? The Bible never commends or encourages this practice. It simply records it as a historic fact. And there's, there's something important here that I do want to, to underline. Because there's a wee bit of confusion sometimes in people's minds. The Bible records many things as historic facts without in any way approving of them. Now, people are often confused by this. They say, well, polygamy is in the Bible, therefore it's all right. I've actually seen people make that point. They said, it must be all right, it's in the Bible. But they've completely failed to distinguish between what the Bible records as a fact, a fact of history, and what the Bible commands or even commends. Nowhere, never, does it commend polygamy. It records it. It says it happened. Sadly, it did. And the Bible also records for us that this practice of polygamy brought trouble and sorrow into the homes that practiced it. It brought trouble into the family of Abraham. You remember Abraham fell into this very situation, the surrogate relationship with Hagar. It wasn't formal polygamy, but it wasn't far off. And that brought sorrow into that home. But they learned nothing because his grandson Jacob finds himself in exactly the same situation. Now, I know there were mitigating circumstances with the two sisters, Rachel and Leah. There was also two concubines involved in that terrible, messy situation. And now it's going to bring trouble into the family of Elkanah. Elkanah is a serious warning. Well, you say, how is this a warning? We're not practicing polygamy. What relevance remotely does this have for us? Well, the warning is this. If you or I set aside God's way or God's word, if we replace it, 
with our own way and our own ideas, we do so at our peril. And no good will come from it in the long run. The two wives in Elkanah's household were unable to get along. Polygamy always places women in impossible positions. And always, always, they are left to try to cope and make the best of it in impossible situations. And indeed, it is a way of oppression for them. That's one of the reasons why the Lord would never have introduced it. Because it opens the door wide open to abuse and oppression and difficulty. Well, the two wives are unable to get along. Hannah has no children. We're told about that in the in the narrative, in the verses here. Hannah has no children. Now in that culture, at that time, that was a big problem. And it was a source of sorrow for her. She struggled with the burden, and as she struggled with the burden, she grew melancholy and depressed and became dissatisfied. Her rival, because she was a rival, Penina, has several children. But that blessing made her proud. It made her insolent. In fact, it made her unbearable. It tells us in the chapter that Penina was prone to vicious, biting sarcasm. Inevitably, Elkanah had a favorite, and Hannah was the favorite. She was probably the first wife. And under her sorrow, she was clearly a godly woman. And Penina was filled with anger. Jealousy is a terrible thing. It's fearfully corrosive in relationships. So Elkanah is a warning against going against God's word and God's way. Put that aside. You do so. But so is Penina. Penina is a warning against an unkind, gloating, hard heart. Penina is a warning against a loose tongue. Penina is a warning against an ungracious spirit. Elkanah is a good example. Elkanah is a serious warning. Finally, Elkanah is a wise counselor. Two things. First of all, he tries to comfort Hannah. Verse 7, at the end of the verse, we read there that she wept and did not eat. Then said Elkanah, her husband to her, Hannah, why weeps thou? Why eats thou not? Why is thy heart grieved? tries to comfort her. He's not dismissive of Hannah's complaints. He's a good man. He's a kind man. He's not so preoccupied with his own concerns that he has no time for her concerns. That's a mark of a wise counsellor and a true friend. And as we'll see next week, Hannah had a better and a, a higher counsellor than Elkanah. The Lord himself. And he is the only truly wise counsellor. You know, other people may help us. 
But like Hannah, we need to take our tears and our cares and our concerns to the Lord himself. And unlike us, he's not too impatient to wait. We can't come too often. The afflicted's prayer he will not scorn. He is a compassionate saviour and the cross proves that. And I wish I had more time to enlarge on that point. Our friend, take your burdens to him, your concerns to him, your cares to him. Ah, oh, you say, I can't pray. Well, where are we going to find an expert in prayer? Nobody's an expert. You take your heart cares and concerns to him. And you take the burden, that, the greatest burden of all, the burden of sin to him. He will unburden you and he will guide you. Thou with thy counsel while I live with me conduct and guide. And to thy glory afterward receive me to the power. Whom have I in the heavens high but thee, O Lord, alone? And on the earth whom I desire besides thee. Let us now. Elkanah is a wise counsel. He tries to comfort Hannah. But secondly, he tries to redirect Hannah's thoughts. You see what he's doing here. Hannah had her legitimate sorrows, and I'm not going to take anything away from that. But there's a lot of wisdom in what Elkanah says to her in verse 8. You're focusing, Hannah, on what you don't have. Maybe, he says, you need to focus more on what you do have. I'm not I better to thee than ten sons. And whatever was true of Hannah, there are times when it's very true of us, and perhaps this applies especially to the Christian. You know, Satan will make us peevish and unhappy with our lot, and he'll work on that. And he'll magnify things in our minds and in our hearts. Friends, we need to look as much at our blessings as we do at our difficulties. We need to look as much if not more at what is for us than what is against us. He tries to redirect her thoughts. Now we're only given a brief glimpse here of the conversation, but everything we know about this man Elkanah suggests that he would have directed her to the Lord. In whom they both believed. You notice the word that's used for the Lord here in the passage. It's used in verse. Um, where is it now? Verse 5. Verse 6. Verse 7. It's the Lord of hosts. The Lord of all the hosts and the armies of heaven. The one. Who has all command under his authority. Focus on him. Turn to him. Rest in him. Trust in him. Well, that's Elkanah. But then the focus is going to move from Elkanah to Hannah. And if we're spared next Lord's Day, we'll see what unfolds in her life. He's a good example. He's a serious warning. He's a wise counsel. May God bless his word. Let's pray. Eternal Lord, we give thanks for this passage in history that gives us a good example, particularly in regard to the things of God. That gives us a serious warning, particularly in regard to our domestic relationships, but that applies in far wider ways than that. And that presents for us a good counsellor. Help us, Lord, to be kindly to those who need our counsel. Give us wisdom so that we will know how to speak a word in season. 
to those who are weary. But send us all to the best counselor of all. We are so inclined to trust in what other people will say to us and the advice they will give to us. Help us to turn to thy word that we will find our counsel there. Counsel in which we can trust. Counsel that will direct us for time and for eternity and will never put us wrong. And that will bring us at last to the cross where the wisdom and grace of God meet in the atoning work of Christ as the Redeemer whose blood removes the stain and the guilt of sin and whose power set sinners free. Bless thy word. Be with us throughout the day and gather with us later. For Jesus' sake. We stay with Psalm 119. We come to verse 33. We're going to sing 33 to 37. Psalm 119 at 33. Teach me, O Lord, the perfect way of thy precepts divine. Teach me, O oh Lord, willing just a couple of intimations the denominational prayer meeting tomorrow night at seven o'clock anybody wants details on how to join that if you speak to me or send me a message our own prayer meeting on wednesday at seven o'clock and the saturday night prayer meeting continuing on the zoom platform at seven o'clock as well 
services next door today as usual, God willing. The English Churchman, for those of you who take that particular magazine, has arrived, and also the latest Daily Bread, Daily Readings, uh, also available uh, here at the door. And all that we plan and purpose is, of course, subject to God's will and appointing. We'll stand now. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion and fellowship of God, the Holy Spirit, rest on and abide with you all, now and forevermore.